Inorganic Chemistry 2342. Here we're going to take our video two for chapter 21, Introduction to Cross Coupling Reactions Catalyzed by Transition Metals. Okay, as we saw before, the mechanism is the cyclic group between uh, reductive addition, <laughs> I'm sorry, oxidative addition, transmetallation, followed by reductive elimination. Okay. And we knew and we figured out that it can happen on sp, sp2, and sp3 hybridized carbons. And so now let's look at some specific reactions and the specific hybridization that the different carbons have when we do this. The first re reaction we're going to talk about is the Heck reaction. And in the Heck reaction, we have our halide compound plus we have a vinyl group. And in this case, we're actually removing the hydrogen off of the vinyl group to create a new sigma bond between the halide compound and our vinyl compound. Okay, in this case, we can use either a vinyl or aerial halide, and it's typically uses iodine or bromine. Now note on this system right here, both of them are sp2 hybridized carbons, okay? So in the Heck reaction, we get an sp2 carbon uh, sigma bonded to another sp2 carbon. And so we end up with lots of conjugated systems in the, in the reaction, okay? The other thing to note is that when we do this reaction, it always reacts on the less substituted time side of the vinyl group, okay? and they typically add trans to this system because of sterics. So in this case here, because we're taking a hydrogen off and a halide off, we have to include a base in the system. So in this system, we'll always see some, a base like triethylamine or pyridine used because we're actually using the hydrogen as a metal because it's a group one metal, and we're using that in that trans uh, metallation step to generate acid at the end of the reaction, okay? So a typical reaction would go where you have some kind of aerial halide here. We get insertion into this palladium material. And in this case, we're using palladium acetate. And our ligands here are these phosphorus compounds here that just donate electrons to the, the, the metal but don't actually form a, a full uh, electron bond with them. When it does this, it does selective insertion between this halide here, and it does selective insertion with the less substituted hydrogen on the vinyl group, giving us our extended conjugation new carbon-carbon single bond, okay? And there are some other derivatives where we can do other chemistry, uh, and those tend to be called the heck Mizukori reactions. But the general Heck reaction is the idea we have an aerial or vinyl halide, reacting with a terminal alkene to generate a conjugated system. Okay. The next reaction I want to talk about is the Suzuki reaction. In all Suzuki reactions, we have boron as the metal that gets transmetallated. So typically we have an alkyl, um, a vinyl or aerial halide, so it's an sp2 hybridized halide in both cases, and we end up getting an extended conjugation system by creating a new sigma bond between those two sp2 hybridized carbons. So a typical reaction would include the uh, formation, the use of an alkyl halide, or I'm sorry, an aerial halide. In this case, it's just bromobenzene, and then some kind of boron derivative. In this case here, we have a boric acid derivative that happens to use this benzene with the diphenol benzene as a uh, group to make it a little more soluble, a little more stable, but it still is reduced off in the presence of aqueous base to give us our boronic acid, which then can undergo the coupling reaction. The bromine and the boronic acid are kicked out, giving us our new sigma bond between our sp2 and sp2 hybridized carbons right here. So it doesn't have to be an aromatic halide. All it has to do is be an sp2 hybridized halide. And in this case here, we have a bromostyrene derivative, which gives us our specificity. Notice it's bonding directly to that uh, benzyl, uh, 
again, a benzoic position. And in this case here, we have the cis boro compound. The cis boro compound yields the cis product. So our stereochemistry of the double bond we use is maintained. So if we had a cis starting material in either the boronate or the, uh, the bromide, we will generate the same um, in the product here. So we have the cis configuration is from this side here. This trans configuration is from the boronate system. Okay. So stereochemistry is retained, so there is no racemization. So we have direct insertion between the sp2 hybridized carbon and the halide. Therefore, there is no transfer. Uh, there is no racemization of stereochemistry. Okay, so the next reaction I want to talk about is Stille. Okay, so in the Stille reaction, this involves the use of a alkyl tin reagent. Okay, so in the alkyl tin reagent, notice we have these three uh, sp3 hybridized carbons are bonded to the tin, but then we have to have an sp2 hybridized carbon so we can get selective insertion between the tin and the sp2 hybridized. Notice we're also bonding this between an sp2 and an sp2 bonds to create extended conjugate systems. In this case, we can use bromine or iodine or occasionally a triflate. Remember, a triflate is the trifluoroacetic acid derivative of an alcohol. It's used to increase the leading group ability of the OH group. So remember that from the alcohols chapter. So in this right here, we can get some really interesting chemistry associated right here. Notice we, again, maintain stereochemistry. So if we insert this bond that is in the cis position, we will generate that cis double bond. And here is our uh, 10 with our three sp3 hybridized carbons on it. We do not get insertion there. We only get insertion between the 10 and sp2 hybridized carbon. And therefore, we have this is our cis stereochemistry for this side. And let me do it in blue here. This is our, I'm sorry, this is our cis stereochemistry with our halide, generates our cis bond here. And our trans stereochemistry of our double bond here is maintained in our trans stereochemistry of this double bond here. All right. One of the weird things that you can actually do with this is you can actually do a compound reaction in the presence of carbon monoxide or CO. And when you do this compound reaction, you end up inserting a carbonyl in between two different vinyl groups. So in the case here, you still have to have a vinyl halide and you still have to have a vinyl tin reagent, but you can insert a CO group in between those two while maintaining stereochemistry of the double bonds. Okay, let's move on to the sonogus here. Up to now, we've been looking at sp2 to sp2 sigma bond formation. In the sonogashira, we actually have an sp1 to sp2 hybridized bonding right here. And in this case, what we're using is the acidity of the hydrogen at the end of the acetylene group, okay? So we get insertion of the palladium catalyst into the, uh, the vinyl halide compound here, and then we get insertion of the metal into the alkyne hydrogen bond, and when it pops out at the end, we end up with our sp1 to sp2 hybridized couple reaction to form a nice sigma bond, and notice they're in conjugation. This works with both the vinyl halides as well as the aerial halides and generates a way to get us to extended conjugations using double, triple bonds. Okay. Now notice in this case here, we have to use an amine base because we have the hydrogen being generated from the alkyne and the halide generating here, generating an acid. So just like in the Heck reaction where we had to use an amine to absorb the acid given off, we also have to use an amine to absorb the acid given off by the Sonogashira reaction. 
Okay, now one of the weirder reactions we're going to look at here is what we call alkene metathesis. Okay, in alkene metathesis, it's basically that we're just changing positions right here. So this common theme in all alkene metathesis is the idea we take a terminal olefin or a terminal double bond and those CH2s from each of those terminal double bonds leave as ethylene and the two other carbons in that double bond become an internal double bond. Okay, so let's look at that again. So again, we can have a long chain here and it doesn't have to be the same, but it could be the same or different right here. And those two long chains will form a new double bond right here. The other two double, the terminal methylenes right here, CH2s, will bind to each other and be extruded as ethylene gas. Okay, so that's the driving force for this. Uh, there are several different catalysts used for this, and Grubbs got the um, Nobel Prize for this. So they typically use a ruthenium catalyst like this. They have since gone to some very uh, commercially available and room temperature and room air stable systems. Uh, but the key, again, is that we end up losing ethylene gas. We create an internal double bond where we had two terminal double bonds. Okay, let's look at that in a little more detail. Okay. So we can do a couple different things. We can make a longer chain. That's the first thing we can do. And so we can couple two of the same compounds right here. We have one, two, three, four, five. So we have uh, pentenes. Notice this is a terminal pentene. Okay. And then so we can bind those together to create a longer chain. And this is an octene plus ethylene. So two of those carbons from the pentene went away to generate ethylene and we have a bond in the middle of that extended uh, alkane now. Now, depending on which catalyst you use, you can have it E or Z, but most of the time you can, uh, you can direct that by what kind of catalyst you use. Okay. So it doesn't have to be just a mono substituted uh, double bond, but it has to be a terminal double bond. So in this case here, we have a di-substituted double bond where this side is di-substituted, but we still have a CH2 here. That CH2 is critical to a metathesis polymerization uh, or reaction. And notice we're binding those right here. So we get a tetra-substituted alkene from the system, and it can again be years even depending on the catalyst, plus generation of the ethylene gas. Again, this terminal uh, methylene group here is the part that goes off as the ethylene gas. Okay, so we can do that with two of the same molecules or we can actually take a ring and open it up. And if we have a double bond inside a ring and we can open it up to relieve ring strain or to uh, decrease entropy, we can have these things open up together. Okay, so in the case of this, it's called ring opening metathesis polymerization or ROM. So imagine you have a small ring like this, and because of the double bond here, it's creating a little bit of ring strain. And so by using this metathesis catalyst, it can ring open up, giving us our double bond. Notice that there is no CH2 at the end of the chain. There is no terminal double bond here. In this case, we end up forming a double bond between those two different double bonds. So it's a slightly different mechanism in the fact that it opens up. We do not extrude ethylene but both of those halves of double bonds become new double bonds at the ends of the chain, okay? Notice that in the second case here, in the first case here, we had ring strain. In the second case here, we have an entropically unfavored compound. We have the octane, octadiene, which is a um, eight-membered ring, which is entropically not favored. And so we can actually use that entropy to help us ring open that polymerization to create this long chain polymer. In this case, it's a polybutadiene by opening up that eight-membered ring to give us our longer chain, therefore saving entropy, and therefore it's driven entropically as opposed to thermodynamically. Okay, 
So we can also use this in the opposite way. We can take a, a material that has two alkenes. As long as we can form a five or six membered ring, we can close this ring to make either uh, alkanes or heterocycles from the system. Okay, so as long as we have a diene that can form a five or six membered ring, we can do this. And so in the case, uh, the simplest case here, we have this uh, octadiene where we have the uh, starting and ending of the octane and we can end up forming a six membered ring to give us our cyclohexene plus our terminal uh, carbons are extruded as the ethylene again. We can also do it with a, a symmetrical or unsymmetrical heteratom in the middle. In this case we, here, we can close the ring, generating a five milled ring with a double bond and extruding out ethylene. Or we can even make a five membered ring here by having an unsymmetrical system. But again, it has two terminal double bonds extruding out ethylene and giving us our five membered unsymmetrical alkene. Okay, so we have two reactions left to look at. The first, the one we're gonna look at is the Cori House reaction. This was introduced when we looked at the Grignard reactions. It's where we have the copper lithium salts of these materials, okay? And by using a catalyst, we can get this cross reaction to occur with or without a catalyst actually. And in the case of the alkyl halides, which is the first thing we saw, we would see nucleophilic displacement to give us our, I'm sorry, yeah, nucleophilic substitution reaction, SN2 reaction, to give us our new carbon-carbon bond between whatever we have, it can be alkyl, aryl, or vinyl, to generate our new carbon-carbon bond right here, or we can use a catalytic system to get a new um, bond system. But notice in all of these, we're using an sp2, to sp3 bond here. We're doing an SN2 reaction to get an SN3 rea to react with an SN2. In this case, we're using an SN2 to react, I mean, uh, sorry, SN3 to react with an SN2. Or in this case, we're getting our SN3 to act with our SN2. So we can actually do it in both directions. It doesn't have to be specifically the copper compound on the sp2 or the sp3, we can get it to react on either one. Okay. All right, the last reaction, which is kind of not really a cross-coupling reaction, but it involves an organometallic reagent that gives us something different than we've had before, is catalytic hydrogenation. Now, up to now, when we talk about catalytic hydrogenations, we actually are doing some kind of hydrogen adsorbed to the surface of a, a metal. Most of the time, it's a solid catalyst, either metal on top of some carbon or a metal surface, okay? And when we have that happen, we tend to call that a heterogeneous catalyst, meaning the catalyst is not dissolved in the organic solution, okay? The last thing I wanna talk about is Wilkinson's catalyst. Wilkinson's catalyst is organometallic um, reagent that is completely soluble in organic solvents. So you can dissolve this uh, rhenium catalyst in a solution and add a little bit of hydrogen gas here, and you can get catalytic hydrogenation onto double bonds. Now, this is completely dissolved. It's what we call homogeneous or soluble catalyst systems. And just like with the uh, solid heterogeneous systems, we still get syn addition, okay? So, even though it's, it's it completely dissolved in the system, we get sin addition for the system. All right, and that is your introduction to organometallic chemistry.